Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful week. So, you know, as you may recall, I started playing the unicorns to teach and share everything I learned over the years as a founder, as an investor. And the show has been really structured in two types of uh, episodes. We have episodes where I'm teaching how to fundraise, sometimes with guests, sometimes with that, latest trends, etc. And the last few, of course, have been coming trends for the coming decade, latest trends in marketplaces for the last 12 months, what's going on in crypto. And today and for the next few episodes, I've decided that we're going to go back to meeting and talking with extraordinary founders or leaders, mostly of unicorn startups, to hear about their journey and uh, to hear about how they got to where they are and all the ups and downs and lessons learned along the way. And so today it's my great pleasure to uh, receive and introduce my great friend, Thomas Bultenga, who actually will we'll go through his story, but a fellow kite surfer, adventure traveler, you know, joined me in the great adventure of OLX and is now the CEO of Vinted, which is a multi-billion dollar European uh, fashion startup that we'll hear more about. So without any further ado, let's get started. So welcome to episode 30 of Playing with Unicorns, a conversation with Thomas Bultenga. Hi, Thomas. Welcome on the show. Thanks. Great to be here, man. It's been a while that we've been talking. Looking forward to uh, catch up. Yeah, it has been quite a while. Uh, I mean, I guess you've been super busy uh, as CEO of Vinted. Uh, maybe for delve into you know the life of like the unicorn startup CEO. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background on like you know your background, where you came from, frankly, even how we met, and uh, and get us to where you are today. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, I started, uh, I grew up in the Netherlands, uh, studied there, and then uh, practically it was a, a bit of an, you know, the coincidence that I, I, I founded the first company together with my best friend. He was also a kite surfer like, like you and me, and we thought, well, if we build our own company, we don't really have to work and we can surf a lot. And um, and then that kind of worked out, but it also didn't work out because it was an amazing business, but we learned how to build a business and it's actually, it's, it's still a business to this day. Um, but I, I met these guys who um, worked at eBay, they started a consulting it, firm. But by the way, do you think that's true? If you build a startup, then you have enough time to go kiting? Well, that's, that, that was like a huge misconception <laughs> because like we, we always, perceived that working was something horrible and we needed to optimize our time to be able to serve as much as possible. And then we started building and then we realized, wow, we really like building businesses and this is actually a lot of fun. And we ended up not much surfing anymore. So that's, <laughs> that's the contrary thing that happened. Um, uh, but, but we've learned a lot, you know, and uh, we met a lot of people that actually explained us how this whole company building works, or at least how internet companies work. And, and that was that consulting company that actually then you and Aspers bought to, to join OLX. And, and that's, you know, how our paths uh, uh, crossed then. That I really opened up my eyes in like how the real big company building is working instead of like the little <laughs> hustle that me and my friend had going. And, and so what did you do at OLX and what did you think of that adventure? And what did you learn during that adventure? Yeah, I think it's it's been one of the most defying uh, times in my life. I think the 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 OLX story and actually what we did at FJ Labs. I think those two things were were fundamentally changing my thinking on 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 how you you build businesses. I think coming into to OLX, I was just like a young person who was good with analytics, and 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 thereby I became somebody who really just liked to help. So. I was thrown into all kinds of problems. In the beginning, uh, in, in Brazil, we really needed to fix product and like prepare it for television campaigns. And I was sent off to, to Brazil for a couple months to help the team there to really change the product. And I did that, I really enjoyed it. And then practically you and the team decided like that we needed an expansion team. And I became part of that expansion team where I kind of did like, I don't know, strategy of which countries we're gonna do and then Obviously, we went to all these countries and how we would enter that, which was, it was 
you know, I, I remember those days, William explaining like, okay, this is how we do television. These are the budgets. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. How we're going to do this. Okay. We need an investment logic. How we're going to build that. And we're kind of from scratch building there together with you guys, all the frameworks on, on how to invest and how to enter markets and how to do this at scale. And then obviously a lot of stuff worked out, but also a lot of stuff didn't work. And there, then again, I, I, I was put into positions to fix stuff. So I think, you know, I always been busy kind of like enjoying the fact that, you know, solving these puzzles, how to fix things, whether it's from customer support, that's not effective to, I don't know, our whole operations in Africa that was kind of like needed a, a bit of a revamp to uh, how do we track television marketing, for example. Why don't you share maybe the craziest fixing story uh, uh, or some of the adventures uh, in the OLX days? You know, perhaps the high speed car chase or any of those. <laughs> I <should try> it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it, it, it was by by default, it was an incredible adventure to be sent all over this world, right? So after I did the Brazil, you guys said, well, come to Buenos Aires and, and build things there. And then when Buenos Aires went well, you said, well, you know, we got to fix stuff in, in Africa. Why don't you move to Nairobi? And I was like, okay, sure. Picked up my, my thing and went to Nairobi. Now, when you come there, that was insane. You, you come into the city at that time that there was just a huge assassination in this, this mall. So in the first three months, I think there were two bombings in my neighborhood. And when I went on a little weekend trip, I literally ended up in, in, in Kenyan armored forces chasing us in a car with a cab that tried to get away of it. It, it was, it was insane. And that was just the free time. So, so it was, it, it, it was an insane time, but at the same time, I really learned that in many of these different geographies, like things are working very differently, whether it's the way people communicate or whether it's how you approach different markets. So for example, in, in, in Kenya, what we discovered is, okay, television is kind of working, but what really works is if we build teams who actually go door to door to explain people how it works. Because we saw how M-Pesa, which was actually one of the first uh, mobile payment uh, companies in Africa that really became successful, that actually activation of a uh, society in Kenya works wildly different than how you do that in Sweden or how you do that in the US. And there, you know, we built huge teams of people that activated people to download the app, explain it, and start for selling their first items. And then we actually build the whole software infrastructure to track that and then to activate these people and to track the activations of that. So we actually built software to do on the ground activation of like mobile app installs, which was, yeah, I don't know, which which was pretty cool. And then, and then we had no way to track, for example, television. And we developed there together with this, you know, Kenyan and Nigerian team. We developed a way how to track television every second. So we we built in together with Diego. Do you remember Diego? I remember there? Diego. He was amazing as well. So so he was somewhere still in Latin America or wherever the guy was. And we had no way to track television in Africa because nobody had that. And then Diego actually built a second per second app install tracker that we could track the app installs and match it to the television spots. And I kind of have a sense of, let's say, you know, what our ROIs were. So there again, you know, building from scratch up, but being in an environment where, you know, big budgets were available and big ambitions were there, you know, to conquer markets and to 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 grow fast. So. Yeah, it was it was it was a wild time. It was, uh, but but learned a lot. You know, it's interesting because when most people, when they're learning, etc., actually don't have that phase where you end up in a place where it's a rocket ship, you have infinite budgets, etc. And so the yeah. I think it's Sheryl Sandberg who once said to say as a career advice, if you could happen to encounter a rocket ship, you know, just hold on for dear life and stay sucked to it yeah. because the lessons learned are so fundamentally different. And also when you're at scale, like everything is statistically significant, right? Like when you're doing product iteration and you have millions of users per day, everything you do is going to be statistically significant. So you could do like the sum total of like 1% improvements a thousand times over is dramatic product improvement. If you have like 50 users, yeah. you know, it's very hard to A-B test because like a random yeah. outcome can completely lead to the, the, the wrong conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's the, the, the vast, uh, the, the vast numbers that you have, but also the, the, the size of the territory in which you can experiment. Yeah. So for example, we would do like completely 
I remember together with William, we would say, okay, let's do in this country, we do television and radio and digital. In this country, we do only out of home and radio. And you really have a wide spectrum of possibilities to test these things uh, in a way that other people cannot and can never do because you have this ability to play in this wild field of, let's say, this huge ambition of this company. And I think that's that's amazing and i think now we're getting at the point at vinted that we have that as yeah. well you know and, and it, yeah it's it's just it's so yeah cool. i mean like, what's really cool is when you think of it i mean olx is now so big right it's like eleven thousand employees in 30 countries it's like 300 plus million unique visitors a, a month but when even when you join which year did you join 2000 10, yeah, I think we're already over 100 million unique visitors a month. So like that, there was already scale. It was a question of like, okay, getting the right unit economics and continue to scale from where we were. Yeah. And in fact, the biggest issue is once you run out of ability to spend money on Google and Facebook, you know, we had to go to TV to go to the next level and bring the offline people online. And so that was, uh, that was really interesting. No, no, I remember that very clearly. Like practically it was like this. We went into this, you guys did the television campaigns, I think in um, in Brazil and yeah. India. And then, uh, so William was like, okay, this works. So uh, Thomas, uh, why don't you make a plan on how to expand to many more countries? And then I remember we made a plan and we thought like, it was also ambitious. We go to uh, five, six countries and we came to you and then Martin, I think. And, uh, and then we showed the plan and we thought like, oh, this is amazing. We're gonna ask for $10 million. <laughs> And then we were in the meeting and you guys said like, well, do that times five and then you get five times the budget and see you next week with a new plan. <laughs> and then <laughs> practically we made a new plan and then you guys said, okay, let's go. And I remember, you know, we were preparing for that and we went live in 15 countries or something. And I remember that week before we went live, the day before the television would go live, I'm like, oh my God, we're going to go into history as the the biggest dumbasses who burned the most money ever, or this is gonna work. And I remember, you know, refreshing my my database account the next day. Is it going up? Is it going up? And and then it actually went up. So it was it was yeah it was it was yeah exciting. I mean that, that's was been the issue with TV right like on Google and Facebook you spend one thousand dollars you know if you're right or wrong and on TV it's changing by the way now you can do connected TV advertising with smaller budgets yeah. but until the connected TVs you had to spend multi million ahead of knowing if it was going to work or not. So, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was, and it, and it worked different in every market. And, uh, um, yeah, but we, yeah, I guess we were lucky a lot. And, uh, but yeah, television at that day was still very effective. Yeah. So it was, it was, a, yeah, like a tank, yeah. you know? So how did that transition, uh, happen for you from OLX to FJ Labs? Yeah. So practically I, I worked with, closely with people that you knew really well and uh, had a couple meetings with you as well. And what I saw at OLX is that um, I think at that time I was also still a bit younger and a bit more fast. I don't know. I wanted more and more. Like I wanted things to move fast and the organization became bigger and bigger. And I think also there were better people there to then, you know, do the more corporate thing. So then, you know, you guys had a new idea and I I remember William and you guys telling me, look, you should join, it's, it's, it's gonna be cool. And then uh, I kind of signed on blindly. I, I, I knew you, I knew William and like, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna go US. Okay, US, it's amazing. I did the emerging markets right now. I don't know nothing about this. Okay, I can do this from the Dominican Republic and I can surf uh, while we play video games in the evening. I mean, okay, let, let's go, man. Uh, I think I, I I didn't really negotiate any of the contract. I think you were so nice that six months later you said like Thomas, you're you're underpaid. Here you have more stock. Here you have a better salary. I just thought like, look, th these are incredible guys, an incredible team. Uh, I'll be part of a small team to to build something new. I can learn a lot. You know, let's give it a go. And uh, and you created conditions that were obviously very attractive <laughs> to me to surf and to work and to uh, to do so so it was yeah I, it felt like the fun and the fun thing to do and 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 to 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 explore new things uh, that, that was actually yeah. the, the and, and by the way that also i mean there was no 
we had no idea early on how it would play out, right? Like we thought no one was going to go after the U.S. because I pushed to Alexa to go to the U.S. and they're like, no, no, no. And then we launched and then like a few months later, they're like, oh, we're doing class size in the U.S. So we changed our mind. And then everyone else decided to do the same thing. And so doing the merger first with Wallapop, then merging with Letgo and like bringing the crew, crew back together. I mean, that was all pretty crazy. And all in like a yeah. year or a year and a half went from like launching a company I mean to, you know, being a billion dollar company. No, no, it was, it was insane. I mean, I, I remember uh, coming in and the first things I did was build some performance dashboards and I was like, okay, we're kind of growing well. And then I was like, okay, let's check how big the competition is. And I built a couple of scrapers, I think, or yeah. something like that. I checked how big the competition was. And that was a moment like, oh, these guys really grew fast and they raised a hundred million or something. And then we started to realize how big it was and then, I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, right? I, I remember we were sitting and thinking like, okay, we cannot go at all country. We have like a couple million on our bank account and we need to centrate it and just go all or nothing, yeah. right? And we selected, I think, three cities, New York, Chicago, maybe Miami yeah. or something, I don't know. And we went all in on those three. And, and that was our life savior, yeah. I think, because we-, we Yeah, got, but, I mean, know. look, in these hyper-local marketplaces, getting liquidity in one city is, is enough. and we showed we knew what we were doing and that led to the merger of Wallapop. And then uh, with Wallapop, yeah. with their fire, and it's interesting because like they had crushed Spain, but they really didn't have a, I think, I don't know if they got lucky or whatever, but they didn't really have a very well thought through strategy plan of what to do next and how to win the US. And so then using their firepower because they raised so much money from amazing VCs to go and fight the US, you know, led to ultimately being able to like do a, a big merger with the top leaders. Yeah, I mean, if, if I think about back about how those two teams merged, like they had an incredible product, yeah. but their market entry into the US, you know, had missed a couple of hygiene factors. Yeah. We were able to identify that plus, you know, bring in, let's say, that aggressive television approach. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of made it uh, made it made us able to do yeah. what we did in the US. It what's interesting yeah. is that, so after that after we merged with them and then merged again with Let Go, which is the OLX entity. Yeah. Uh, we went on and like tried to work on like so many different projects. I think the most crazy one back at that time was like trying to buy eBay classifieds in 2015. I don't know yeah. if you remember that one. You're now talking about it like that happened afterwards, but that was I know it was happening at the night. same time. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, we'd come back from guide serving, then you would say, "Okay, Thomas, I now got this project. We're gonna go on a call with these private equity guys, and we're gonna try to raise a billion to buy eBay." I think seven billion or three billion. I don't remember. It was a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that exactly. was exactly. Let's sell the time. billion dollar company on the one side. Let's raise a few billion to buy <laughs> to buy eBay on the other side, yeah. and let's guide surf and play video games in the middle. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, we got a lot of stuff done uh, during it's, that. It's period. too. Yeah, I mean, it's too bad that one didn't happen, and that they that eBay changed their mind. That would have been fun. Yeah. 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 Well, well we we yeah. gave it a good try. I mean. Uh, it was not that yeah. we didn't put in the effort, but uh, it was but not yeah. the right time. And the, the funny thing is the right time was last year, and I tried again <laughs> and got to the finish line and lost the bid and I the Vinta one. Uh, so, you know, but, but at the yeah. end of the day, I think in hindsight, I'm not sure you and I would have been the best in the, to like turn around uh, eBay class-wise because it's like a big yeah. organization with like different product line, different products, different, partly political, you know, I think we're better in like thing. I mean, OLX was like built by me for me. <laughs> like I see something, it happens. And I think going in an environment where it's yeah. not that at all, I think would not have been necessarily your forte. We might have like died. So I don't know. I mean, I I'm already uh, you know learning you know constantly now to, to run a company at the size of Vinted and running an eBay that would have not been my. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, same like here. So I, sure. Yeah, that's why I was right. thinking maybe we can get the private equity guys to get like a, a, an operator to like do all the shit we don't like to do and loves focus on like product marketing, positioning, etc. <laughs> so, so how did the transition happen then to to Vinted and and tell us about the Vinted story? Yeah, so so we were um, uh, the the deal with Wallapop and Let Go happened and. Um, uh, so we were in New York and actually the, the plan was to start a new company with you. I was actually going around New York with new business ideas, interviewing people and like uh, that was the plan. I also took a week off because we had a bit of an intense period. 
Um, and um, in, uh, in, in that weeks, the two weeks, that, that period, uh, one of the investors, Elodie of uh, Insight, approached me and said like, hey, we saw what you did with, uh, with Wallapop. We have this company in, uh, in Vilnius. Uh, it's not going that well, but they're great people. Do you want to go and help? And I said like, no way. I'm in New York. I'm not going to go to Lithuania. I'm going to build a company with Fabrice. That was awesome. And uh, no, love you, but uh, thank you. And the LOD uh, is, is good, is very good not giving up. So three uh, breakfasts later, I said like, okay, I'll, I'll take a call with the guys if you tell they're so cool. So I take a call with the guys and they're incredible. So like all of these guys grew up in Soviet Union, backgrounds in mathematician, engineering, but like not like just doing the studies, like winning medals and stuff like that. At their 13s, they built like server companies and software for, for accounting. I was like, wow, these guys are brilliant and they're so passionate about what they're building. And I said, okay, so send me the data and show me what the issue is. Like, maybe I can help a little bit. Show me the data. I was like, whoa, okay, you're really in a tough spot. Like metrics were going down. And uh, and I thought, you know what? I felt a little bit of that pain. Um, you know, that, that, that Wallapop deal, I mean, financially, everything was a good deal, but you know, in a way, like we were aiming and we, we sold and we had to leave the, the, the wallop of founders alone again and it felt a bit like ah uh, also felt a bit like, like you know how you sometimes as a founder can yeah. be really part of this huge vc game where in which you're in and i i felt that pain with wallop a little bit you know of a goose for example i felt how it hurt them and i saw it how it was hurting them and i thought like you know what maybe i can help them at least I will from it because these are incredible smart people. You know what? I'll go over for like a month or so. And they said, okay, can you come over for five weeks? I said, okay, fine. Book me some tickets, get me an Airbnb close to the office and I'll be fine. And um, so I went. And uh, so I told you like, hey man, I'm gonna go for five weeks and see you in five weeks. And you said, okay, cool. Five weeks, perfect. Then we'll meet in Vancouver uh, and we can meet there and uh, or, or in Canada or somewhere you were. I don't know anymore where. And then we can start the new business. I said, okay, that's cool. I'll explore the Eastern European countries and see you soon. I went there and um, things went wildly different. Like I really connected with the guys. They were super smart and I really you know, loved how they wanted to build this business. And then I worked really hard um, together with them to find a way out, you know, how, how to solve this. And um, so practically I started to look into how the whole proposition of Vinted compares to all the other propositions in the market. And I started to compare that, start to analytically think about how can we change the proposition that's very attractive, yet has good economics, and then you know becomes a vehicle that can grow fast uh, and can uh, attract investments. And um, uh, what, what, what happened is um, I, I also, at the same time, my girlfriend at that time uh, left me. So I, I was a bit in a spot that I was alone in Lithuania. Uh, my girlfriend left me. Uh, I was with this company who was going down, and I got in a bit of this like angry work mode. You know, you, you can have these times that you're like, "Fuck all this shit, let's change everything." And I got into that mindset, and and I went like, "Okay, let's really change the opex. Let's really change the business model. Let's change this." And I gave this aggressive plan to the guys, and it was reasonably thought through with some good numbers behind it. I explained it to them and then they were like, yeah. But maybe you should describe it a minute. Was what like, was Vinted then? Uh, and what, did, what was the plan? Yeah, so, so the Vinted then was actually the uh, same business model as Poshmark, but they started as, let's say, a Greg's mm -hmm. list for fashion. So it was free, community-based, really nice in an app, not like Greg's list with a shitty product, but like Greg's list uh, with a nice mobile app. And then at a certain point in time, the investor said, okay, now you need to monetize to make the unit economics work. And they said, okay, fine, let's pick the uh, model of Poshmark. And the founders were a bit like, really? And the investor said, yeah, absolutely, that's going to work. But it didn't work because, you know, in Europe, you had great classifieds, which is practically trading for free. And you had Vinted then with a 20%, 15% take rate on sellers. And therefore, the whole platform started to decline. So in the beginning, beautiful organic growth, like, they built a great product, but you just grew fast. Then they put the monetization on and it just kept on falling down. 
And then what we did is that we said, okay, what if we change the proposition? So we make the cost to the seller completely zero. We make a small to the buyer, but we also offer them, you know, cheaper shipping and other, you know, safety escrow uh, options and insurance. And then it practically becomes on both sides, cost neutral to zero. And then you practically have a free product with all the extra stuff that let's say a Poshmark offers in terms of safety and shipping and payments. And that really worked because not only did we do that, we also changed the way we do marketing and we did that with, with television marketing, for example. And we added extra revenue streams on value added services and advertising to get to a take rate on the total GMV that actually would have a good you know, gross margin and a good LTV that you could do marketing on, 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 um, on with a proper uh, cuck. So, so in that way we changed it, but what was to my mind, it was mind blowing was that I was sitting there with Mantis and Eustace in a room and I was describing like, we're going to completely destroy your seller fee. It's going to be practically zero. We're going to, uh, uh, then introduce a very small fee, build new revenue streams that are unproven. And then the little cash that you have left over, we're going to blow it in one month on television. And they were like. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Let's go. I was like, you guys have the biggest balls. Like, it's it's amazing. Okay, if you want to do this, you know, I, I, I will help you out. So I worked for a while just for nothing with them, changing the company, launching the television campaign, and then doing everything. And at that point in time, I saw that whole team, you know, just stepping behind the plan, taking the risk, and everybody in that company wanted it to work, you know? And that felt like, wow, I'm in a place where people really, you know, value my opinion. They go stand behind the plans that I make and they're all fighting together. And it really felt good, you know, to be a part of a team that is like fixing something. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And then it, uh, then it and so started. that was what year and, uh, where does that take us to today, relatively speaking? So, so that was 2000, summer, 2016. And uh, then we launched, uh, so I came mm -hmm. in uh, July and then in September, we changed the model in uh, Germany. And then in January, we changed the model in France. And then we did the first uh, television campaign in France, uh, 7th of uh, January. And then the 14th of January, I saw how the whole week was growing and I was like, so, so it's working. So it, that was the moment we thought like, holy fuck, we actually have a chance to survive. And uh, uh, then we, from January 2017, we were able to reach break even nine months later from then. And then the company was safe because before that, like the cash was like churning away. And I think we hit it break even with only like 3 million of cash or, 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 or like, Five million of cash on the account. But in order to like get there, I mean, you had to cut a lot of burn. I mean, how many people did you go from to to, and like, how difficult was that transition? Yeah, so that that's another part of the story. So now we just talked about you know changing marketing and changing, uh, uh, let's say, the business model. A very another very big part was organized in a different way, which was two parts. We practically thought backwards from like, okay, what are the absolutely essential people that we need to build the things that we need to survive. And then we completely rebuilt the org from that. And then uh, we looked, okay, what does that mean? That, that means we don't need all the offices in all the other worlds because they yeah. have beautiful offices in Munich, LA, London, Paris. So we closed all the offices. Uh, we had to fire half of, of all the people, uh, which, you know, all those people did a great job. They were just, at, you know, in the wrong position uh, uh, at this point in time. So it was incredibly painful. Many of these people were very good friends of, of all the people that were working. They did a great job. And, you know, Mantas, one of the founders, even his wife, who is practically also a founder of, you know, since since the beginning, she also had to step away, for example, to, to minimize the management team. So the management team as well shrank to half of the size. All the offices were closed, everything centralized. And then the people that were left over was a small group of around 100 people. And then with that group, we, we we fought ourselves to that break even, like every week looking at how do we- So you went from how many people to how many people? Transaction down from 300 people to roughly- yeah. So you divided costs, monthly costs by three or more than that? When you cut all, all everything else? Yeah, by three. Yeah, 
I think three because yeah. offices were closing down. And okay. uh, so, so by three, I think. So we minimized the cost by three. And then, then the whole game started of getting, let's say, the cost per transaction to another level. So you, when you look at your business model, you, you yeah. have servers running, you have all kinds of subscriptions, you have payments costs. So we started dramatically cutting that, renegotiating every contract, building software to replace software that we were renting and bringing that cost per transaction down. And at the same time, we were building up the new revenue streams like us, uh, yeah. uh, ads and VAS, and they're constantly getting the adoption up. So our cost per transaction was going down and then the revenue per transaction was steadily going up. And then nine months later, it reached this point that we could, you know, hold up our own pants and and so where are we at yeah, today? That, was, that was a big relief that that was today we're at uh yeah we're talking billions of of, of gmv uh, and we're um we're i think the biggest fashion market second-hand fashion marketplace in After the world Poshmark? and uh we, we... no Poshmark so, is, so who's uh, bigger not bigger i mean uh I, I so who's the, he said you had the second mean, largest so who's the largest thing. Oh, you are the largest. No, largest, okay. largest, largest, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I'm not aware of any other company. Maybe there's somewhere in China or something. But Porsche is big in the US. You could say Mercari is very big yeah. in fashion in Japan. But, you know, we yeah. have a couple of very big countries where we're very, very big. If you look at the penetration ratios, we are reaching in a country like France, that, that wildly different from what, for example, Porsche Mark is able to do in the US. So we, we, we we're now a company with, um, I think, 1,200 people, mostly centered still in Vilnius. We now have an office as well in Berlin and in Amsterdam, where we're building uh, hubs as well. And, and most of your and, users uh, are yeah, in we're, we're Western Europe, or what, can you talk to that, or? Yeah, so, so practically also one of the things that really worked well for us is staying focused so we really stayed for a long period of time focused on france and then from france we built it out to belgium first learned about the international trade then went to spain and to the netherlands then uh, uh then we went into poland uk germany italy portugal so our core is uh, western europe um, and we're expanding in europe further um and practically we now cover most of Europe's value. We're still connecting smaller countries and developing the countries that we just connected. So for example, we just connected uh, uh, the UK and we connected uh, this year uh, Italy, um, uh, but we have really strong positions there and very strong growth dynamics in those new countries as well. So our core is Europe at this point in time and we're you know, getting ready. Are, to, are there to any countries you tried where it didn't work or any lessons learned along the way? And like, so because we went through the turnaround and now things are going up uh, but is it all up and to the right, or were there also lessons learned along that way? No, no. Like how I tell the story, it looks like gradually everything worked, and but how how the real story is like practically everything failed, and sometimes we had a success. <laughs> so we we started with France, and then uh, uh, we're so excited, we're like, okay, let's try US, uh, and maybe. Maybe let's try UK as well because they're both English markets. So we, we tried, and the first try we did there, unit economics were just extremely bad. Like it was not working at all. We're like, okay, this doesn't work. And then we went back to the drawing board. We said, okay, then let's try the UK one more time because it's two times better. Also didn't work. Then we said, okay, you know what? Let's get back to basic. What is the most similar country to France? Okay, Belgium. Let's try Belgium. And then that worked, and we learned a lot in Belgium, even though it's another country which is very similar, a lot of different different things we learned expanding to another country. And you actually learn a lot about France yeah. by going to Belgium. It's 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 in the details. Um, and and then after Belgium, when Belgium worked, um, we we again tried the UK. Again, didn't work. And uh, then uh, we we tried uh, Germany. Germany didn't work. Okay. Then we tried Spain. Spain worked. And then we continued to invest in Spain and we learned a lot about Spain and then we became more confident about our game. And then actually after that, our expansions became smooth. So then the, the, the Netherlands was actually kind of an easy ride. I mean, we had, we, we acquired a, a player there as well, but it, it, it re we really understood how it worked and we could play out a playbook. So by that time, we had run France through, let's say, a certain level of maturity. And we've seen, let's say, how this story plays out. And we were able to build frameworks. 
with market phases and understand you know how to track it and how to get it done and at the same time we massively improved our product on many different things that you are know, little holes before that we were not even aware of and that enabled us now to you know after the netherlands to do all kinds of expansions such as it oh, so you're UK, it, it is you're in the Portugal, uk now and it's Poland. working in the uk yeah yeah so 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 it's it, that was a, yeah so i think we tried that market I, I told you two times, but we tried it like five times. Uh, and and like my investors hated us. Like, again, you're going to try this? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, you know, Henrik, for example, as well, you know, and he's like, he, he's a very long term thinker and he, he, I, I love him, but he was like, really? Again, the UK? Come on, Thomas, get game together. You tried it three times. How stubborn are you going to be? But we tried again. And then in COVID, what we saw in COVID, we saw real acceleration and, and we thought like, you know what, if it's growing so fast and the dynamics are really changing, let's take advantage yeah. of it and throw some money against it and see if it works. And then it actually went up and then we really improved the product and then went again with all the learnings that we had from all the other markets and then it just exploded. And and like, I think in three months on listing levels, we were matching Depop and-, and So yeah, it, you it asked this next? <laughs> The yeah, yeah. So, so, well <laughs> maybe so so what, what so what's next for you now you're the CEO of a 1200 person multi billion dollar unicorn uh, first of all is it still as much you know fun in a way as like because now it's getting bigger right like and so things like things get slower yeah. political games start being played you have to do more reporting you have to start thinking if, if you're going public or not I yeah. mean like yeah yeah well I think. Certain things go slower, but a lot of things are also going a lot faster. And I, I think one of the decisions I'm very happy we took early on is that we gave everybody stock and we still do that. And that what that really does at a certain point in time, people realize how much the stock is worth and they really park their egos on the side and they're like, okay, what's best for the company? And if you have those kind of dynamics in your teams, then you're actually you're in this phase where you have so much capital to play with, so much opportunities to go after that you can, you know, do all kinds of tests and launch new initiatives sure. and, and, you know, learn new things. That's actually very exciting. So it is still exciting and it still feels that we're moving fast. Like we're launching new countries, trying new initiatives. But on the other hand, you know, uh, certain decisions, they go slower. I mean, like it's 1200 people. You, you really have to behave differently when you're talking on all hands and like you have have to really think through how you build your organization. Yeah. So a lot of that time goes into that, which is very different than we had before. But the team I work with, it's a very, you know, passionate group of people that I've worked with a long time now. So it's still a lot of fun. And and when I look now at, for example, at our board decks or you know our strategies, it's just like this whole plate of opportunities. And it's more like cool. okay, which one are we gonna get first? You know, are we gonna do this? Or so it's like that? new countries, and new verticals. Yeah, yeah. So it's from, let's say, from new business models, new countries, new verticals, new, like, how do you going to really, really ensure that, let's say, over the next decade, you build a product that is still relevant and is super valuable for your users. Uh, and that is, and that, and that you then just kind of like, in our management team, we kind of accept like the product that we have now, nice, but five years from now, yeah. if it stays the same, it's dead, you know, we need to to really get to another level, different business model, different type of system that really enables us to to add more value to our users. Uh, question from Luke: um, Did you did your marketing strategy follow the confinement periods in the different markets? And so, when people were confined, you do one strategy. When they were not confined, you do a different strategy. Because obviously, the the lockdowns were very different in different geos. Or was it unrelated to that? Yeah. No, no, it was it was. Uh, it was absolutely related to that. So lockdowns came and we had no clue. And uh, one of the things that was not even clear is like, are our packages spreading the virus? So in France, there's nobody else who sends more packages, you know, C2C drop off points than us. So we were sitting with the management team, like if this is spreading through packages, we're the biggest spreader in France yeah. and we don't want to go down like that. So we actually took a decision completely shut down all our services for like a few weeks and completely rebuild our shipping system, build in delays, align with the government and then go live again. And then we went live again um, 
we didn't decide to market because it was a very sensitive period, but we saw that everything organically came back. And then we actually did, we felt like, you know, the whole world is suffering. This shouldn't be a period that we profiteer on this. So while there is a lockdown and we're doing this, we're donating a certain amount and we donated more than a million to COVID relief funds in uh, in Europe. And then when people were safe, we know for sure it's safe. Our, you know, our suppliers are in a good place. You know, the delivery guys are all taken care of. Everything is cool. Then we said, okay, let's accelerate now. And then our marketing was switched on again and we could market more sure. because it was working better. People were compliant and-, and uh, you, you said our uh, suppliers, are you mostly C2C or B2C? Okay. Totally C2C. Uh, but with suppliers, I mean supplier of uh, ah, shipping see, services, see. payment services. Uh, so there, we're working with like a huge variety of shippers all across Europe, and all of them obviously needed to adapt, and we want to give them time to adapt, work with them in a way that it's safe for their work. So, well. I mean, very important question. Do you still get, I mean, you, you started this entire journey saying, if I start a startup, I'm running a startup, I'm going to be able to kite more and surf more, et cetera. So how's your kiting coming along? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guiding, guiding kind of went away, but in um, in Lithuania, they have very big uh, mm -hmm. a wakeboarding culture. So you have lakes that are like 15 minutes away from the office. Uh, so I go wakeboarding after, um, after, after work and summers in Lithuania are long and very warm. So, you know, I'm wakeboarding three to four times a week in the evenings in the summer. And in the winter, uh, they literally have 15 minutes away as well. Uh, a huge uh, skiing slope where they build a snowboard park. So then I go snowboarding. And uh, during uh, during COVID, I, I had the opportunity to go to the coast and work from the coast. And actually the wind in uh, the Lithuanian coast in the summer is also pretty good. So I, the water. I still surfed, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> not warm. It's not warm, but it's... The more so, you know, it's 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 not uh, not the same as your holiday home uh, uh, temperature, uh, but uh, but but it's still good. And uh, so this is actually the first year I got some kiting done again. To be honest, you know, the first two years vintage, yeah, it was just full time work. It it was it was really really tough. Like and the sacrifices my team and I brought then to you know in terms of working. Yeah, there was yeah. no wakeboarding, there was no kiting. It was just like late night, all of us churning. And there's a certain charm to it. I'm happy that time is over. I look back to it now a bit romantic, even though it was very painful. Um, but but yeah, over the last two years, I actually was really able to start uh, waking again. Uh, and anything we didn't again. cover, we should have covered or discussed? Anything you want to share? Uh, anything I want to share? Well, I, I think one of the things that I um, that I think that we didn't didn't mention, but that what I've learned like by being thrown around by OLX over all these countries, is that you know all these different places you have so many misconceptions about how they are and you know and what's going on. And even after living in 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 Africa and in um, in Latin America and the Middle East, even when I had to go then to 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 Eastern Europe. I thought like, oh yeah, this is gonna be like this poor region of Europe where everything still looks like the Soviet. And and you know, I think if I think of it, I had so many misconceptions about all the places I went through. And and and, and I think you know, for many people, you know, realize that and and just explore all those areas and 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 don't be afraid to go there because you can have fantastic adventures and 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 build incredible businesses in these areas that might look kind of strange to you from the beginning. So I think that that's one thing we didn't cover, but I think it's important. To and know. so you speak Lithuanian now? <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I'm, yeah, this is one of the disadvantages <laughs> of having a focused character. So the, you kind of know me when I focus on something, I do that. <laughs> so I didn't focus on learning a new language. And everybody makes sense perfectly English well English uh English i hope you can answer. join us at the next fj yeah. labs retreat uh it's uh, we're going uh to rebel soak yeah, in love. canada february 8 to 14 to brainstorm about what extraordinary ideas don't exist in the world in 2022 that should to make the world a better place so it'd be fantastic go heli skiing with you and uh and brainstorm and get the and, and share all of your updates with the team if you're up for it 
Sounds amazing, man. Sounds amazing. Perfect. Well, Looking thank you. And thank you for the audience for uh, tuning in. Uh, next few weeks, we'll have different guests. We're going to be covering a book review next week. We're a, an author of a book. We're covering we the founder of Shippo coming in the next few weeks. So uh, it'll be great to see you every Thursday noon as usual. Thank you, Thomas. Pleasure.